All right, so for today the big topic is a shorter one, I think, and uh, less for you to write down. You wouldn't necessarily have to write any of the notes down because all of the tips that I'm going to go through with you are also included in your lab manual as part of Lab 45. That seems like a very odd place to have these tips shown, but that's a, a, a lab that I put those tips into when I wrote it up around the first time and just kind of left them there and have never taken them out because they're a pretty important uh, bunch of things to do right for all of your graphs and uh, that way they're always sort of in the back of your lab book for you um, sort of in the, as the appendix to the lab book so if you look at lab 45 and you look to the second page of that lab you'll find them listed there in a box um, so you wouldn't have to write all these down if you didn't want to if you wanted just to refer to that list instead you could just follow along see how I do it and maybe start making your graph at the same time for lab 1 which is your first official lab where everyone has data to graph and uh, kind of take it from there. It's up to you. If you do want to put them into your, your notes, you're certainly welcome to do that. So I'm going to kind of flip back and forth from a list of tips to actually doing it on screen with you here uh, on a graph that's uh, digital, drawing things in and uh, putting the information on the screen so that you can see what I mean for each of the tips. So there are several tips that we're going to go through on this and so we'll move on to those. The first uh, tip is that you should always draw a graph on graph paper. It seems very logical. A lot of folks will try to tr draw a graph sort of freehand on a white piece of paper or even on a piece of notebook paper. Um, it's best just to use already printed graph paper. Uh, there's plenty of it available. There's some in the back of your lab book. There's extra sheets there. Uh, there are also uh, extra sheets available in our in uh, trays in my classroom. If you need some, just ask. And we have some that have larger squares too than what's in your lab book, which a lot of people prefer. So make sure to use graph paper. You also want to make sure that your graph is nice and large. Uh, half a page is a pretty good minimum size. Anything bigger is better, and sometimes I'll ask you to use a whole page uh, specifically, but I'll let you know when that is. In the meantime, a half a page is a pretty good minimum. Anything smaller than that, it can be really hard to see the relationships between the x and y axes and the data that you've plotted, especially when we're looking at trends um, and extending the data beyond what's there in your data points, extrapolating the data and trying to make conclusions from it, which we'll do as soon as Lab 3, which is coming up here in just a few days. So make sure it's nice and large on a page. If you have to start with a fresh sheet for your graph, do so. Don't worry about using a whole new sheet or a new side. Um, to learn, it's important sometimes to, to use another sheet of paper, so go ahead and do that. And then lastly, you want to use a ruler uh, to mark and, and sort of in, enhance or darken the axes and when you need to draw a best fit line that's straight, it's also appropriate to use a ruler for that. So I'll switch over to my graph here if I can and uh, show you where you should darken in the lines for the axes, even if they're already printed on the page. So here's a, a graph that I'll go through a little bit with you and draw a few things on. This is kind of just a blank, sort of roughly a half sheet of graph paper as we'd see it on the screen. I've gone with a little bit bigger squares than what's in your lab book, mostly because it's a little easier to see things and show you things on the screen especially if you're viewing this on a cell phone where the, the pixels would get pretty tight together if I used fine paper. So what you want to make sure to do then as you're, as you're uh, starting your graph out, again, start with a piece of paper that's nice and big, and then also um, uh, start with uh, at least a half a sheet. I'm going to go ahead and darken in my y-axis over here, so put down kind of a, a darker line, enhance that a little bit. I've got a nice straight drawing line tool, which makes life easier for me, but I would use a ruler, again, as I mentioned. And across this one too, I'm going to go ahead and put just a darker line in there so I enhance that a little bit. I'm not sure that it's the end of the world if you don't have it, but I would ask that you try to remember to do it whenever you can. And so we kind of got it set there as far as the tips go. So let's jump back to those. The next tip is that you want to have the right variable on the right axis. So in your lab, you collected data every 20 or 30 seconds for heating a test tube of water over a candle. Nothing too major, but data nonetheless. So how to handle that? Well, in this lab, you want to think about what were you controlling and what were you measuring as a result of that? Or, said another way, what was the independent variable and what was the dependent variable? Well, in this lab, of course, you were controlling how long the test tube was held over the flame. So the time of heating, or the time, was your independent variable. And the dependent variable is then what you were measuring changing as a result, which was temperature. So you want to make sure that you get the right thing on the right axis and that you label it like that. So the next thing says you want to have labels and units on both axes. So in this lab, the label would be time and temperature. The units would be seconds uh, or something like that and temperature in Celsius degrees. So if we jump back to that graph here, I'm going to hide my timer. If we get back to the graph here, 
and we start to label that, then to, to put it on the graph, I'm going to put on this side temperature, since that's my y-axis. I wouldn't mind if you abbreviate it as temp. And down here, time. Across the bottom. And then again, make sure you're labeling it however you're, you're using your units here. So this is going to be seconds. And on the other side, we'll use degrees Celsius for our units. I'm feeling like I'm a little crowded down here already, so hopefully on your margin you've got a little bit more space. So that's the labels. And then the next thing is you want to um, scale the axes evenly. So this is a little tricky to explain. Let's just jump back over to the graph. You want to scale them evenly on both axes. In other words, you want each box to be the same size or worth the same amount. So if I go to my x-axis down here with time, let's say I collected data for, what, three minutes. That's 180 seconds. So if I sort of count this little label off, I'm going to start this as zero, my initial. And if each box across here is worth 10 seconds, I don't need to mark and label every one. Maybe I'll mark and label since I collected data every 20 seconds. Maybe I'll make a mark for every two boxes. That would be 20 seconds. And I could do the same here at about 40. And continue across. I should have enough room if I were to go across the whole way here for all of my data and maybe even a little bit more, which is good. Sometimes we want to have a little extra space. Now again, I'm getting a little crowded here, so I won't go across and try to label them all. Um, but we'd have this be 100 seconds. This could be 120, 140, 160. If I had a little more space, I'd write those in for you, and I'm a little tight. So this is 180. This would be my three-minute mark. And if you collected data for that long, then you'd be good to go. Okay. So I label about every 20 seconds in here, and that should be good enough. So each box is worth 10 seconds. I wouldn't want to make the first boxes worth 10 seconds, and then when I realize that I don't have enough room over here, make each box worth 20 to squeeze it in. That's not fair. Um, or, or even, and you're misrepresenting your data. And then up the other side, I'm going to start with zero again. That's actually one of the tips that's coming up. Start with zero, and maybe because I, I don't have a temperature that goes very high, I'll just make each box worth, I don't know, um, four degrees, five degrees. So if this is worth five, and this is worth ten, again, I don't have to label every one of them. This is 20 Celsius, 30. I don't know how hot your water got, but I doubt it got much more than 50 degrees. In case it did, I'll go a little bigger. And you can, again, you want to plan your graph out. So make sure as you're starting the scaling that you're leaving yourself enough room. Count out the boxes and determine if how you need to scale things to get things to fit. That can be the trickiest thing to learn if you're not real good at graphing yet. So I'm assuming no one's temperatures went bigger than about 60. So that's kind of how it would look. So I set down here intervals of each box being worth 5 degrees. And that's even all the way up. And across the bottom, each box being worth 10 seconds. They don't have to be worth the same number, they just have to be even on each axis. 10 across the bottom, 5 up the side, so that's fair. Alright, the next thing is that you want to label the, the axes with tick marks so people can tell where we're at. That's those little blue, little, little blue dashes that I put in here kind of as I was going along, little tick marks. It's important that when, you, when you're writing in, especially if you're writing in a lot of numbers, that you, that you label them because sometimes they get crowded enough to where you're not sure exactly which box you're looking at. That's especially true on that finer graph paper that's in our lab manuals. There's lots of lines there. Which one is 20? Which one is 40? You want to label them with little tick marks if you can. Also, the axes should start at 0, 0, and I did that. You can see down here in the bottom left corner, my first box, my first corner was 0, 0. And I didn't start at a higher number. Just because my starting temperature of water was 22 degrees doesn't mean I need to start at 20 down here. My first point may, may be way up here, and that's just fine. The other thing you don't want to do, and I see this on occasion, I'm just going to clear off this axis so I can show you what I don't want you to do. Let me clear this out real quick. What I don't like to see and I don't want you to do is, for example, if you ever saw this on a graph where people will kind of compress it and kind of put this zigzag feature in here. Let's say we were talking about much bigger numbers. So this was 60 and this is 70. And they didn't want to have all that empty space at the bottom of their graph, so they just went ahead and sort of squished it down with this little zigzaggy symbol. You see that a lot in graphs. I don't ever want you to use that in class unless I specifically tell you to, and I don't think that'll ever happen. Um, what this does is takes away the value of zero. No point in putting zero down here if you're going to squish the first 60 units into a little bit of space. Otherwise, it's kind of you're, you're sort of making it uh, uh, no longer possible to even connect the zero to anything on the graph. 
because it's not evenly spaced anymore. You've kind of broken that rule that each box be worth the same amount of space or the same number of units of temperature degrees, for example. So don't compress it or use that little trick. Um, it's much better that all your data would be way up at the top of the page, if that's what ended up being the case, than to squish it down with one of these little compressing symbols. I'm not even sure what the heck they're called. But don't do those. So I'll take that back off and uh, we'll just undo that real fast, get us back to where we were. All right. And then the last thing I'll mention is that they should not be bar charts. Um, unless you're doing something like a few of you did in the paper towel lab, bar charts won't have a place very often in chemistry this year. Um, you might find them more often with like a biology sample population sort of thing or maybe an economics class or something like that, I'm not sure. But chemistry we typically are going to use XY line graphs and then try to make trends come out of our data as we graph it and draw in best fit lines. The other thing you might include is a title on your graph. Um, on this graph we could call it lab one or you could include with that then uh, that you've got temperature and time and you always want to title your graph with the y-axis first temperature and then we usually say temperature versus time it doesn't it sounds like a, a matchup to a game or something but it's temperature versus time and the format then for a title is usually y the y-axis versus the x-axis that's sort of the, the format up there in general. So whatever data you're plotting, that's a very traditional and, and safe way to title your graph if you don't know how else to title it. Y variable versus X variable. So now that I've got my graph set up, I'd like to uh, just kind of plot a couple points on here and so that you see me putting a few dots on and understand sort of where those things go. Um, as we're looking at the graph then, uh, you'll notice I've kind of brought in my, my data table just so I have something to work from and I can show you what numbers I'm using without flipping back and forth. You wouldn't want your data table laying on top of your graph like this. I've just sort of uh, laid it on top so that you can see the data that I'm going to graph for you. So right here my initial water temperature was 19 and a half degrees Celsius. So that would have been at time zero when we started. 19.5 would be somewhere right about in here. Um, I'm going to use red just so it pops up nice and bright. Now it doesn't matter if it's dead on the money or not and with my graph not having very fine lines I've definitely limited myself. If you think well it's 20 degrees more or less right 19.5 well you can start you can you can back it off and put it back in there nice and clear wherever you want it to be. Um, take your time and graph it well. And notice I've got a dot that's big enough to see but it's not huge. I see some people make massively big dots there and it's just more than you need to have. 20 seconds later my temperature was 21 degrees Celsius so that's gonna go kinda right about here a little bit warmer uh, 25.6 degrees at 40 seconds so I go to 40 and come up to about 25 here just a little more than 25 so basically right in there the next one is 28.6 and that's at 60 seconds so nearly 29 which would be just a little under 30 so here and then we kind of continue on from there. At 80 seconds, it's only gone up to about 30.4 degrees, so just a little bit warmer right in here. And then 35.4, and so forth. So I'm just plotting in my data points. And you notice they're not going to necessarily make a straight line. They, they don't have to. They don't necessarily have to make a straight line at all. When I'm all done with it, I'm going to put in a line of best fit or a best fit line, uh, depending on who you talk to. And so that's the last feature to, to include. I've only got six of my data points plotted on here. Uh, I would say you want to plot all of your points, um, all you know, eight or ten, however many you've got from your, from your lab trial. I'm just going to draw you a line of best fit while I've got some of them on the screen so you can see what that would look like. Um, and then we'll save a little time. So a line of best fit should pass sort of straight through the middle of as many points as possible here or in between the points and not necessarily touching all the points because to do that would be a zigzag line or a wiggly one here. That's not what a line of best fit should be. Most lines of best fit that we'll deal with will, will be more or less a straight line uh, that, that would be drawn with a ruler. There are some cases when it won't be but this is what we would consider a linear relationship. So I'm going to go ahead and draw in a line of best fit with my little straight line drawing tool. You would use a ruler and do about the same sort of thing. Now you don't need to start a best fit line by connecting to the very first point. I see a lot of people who think they need to start their best fit line and branch it off from their, from their initial point. I also see some people who think they should just connect the first and last points. Now if I did that, you don't want to do that. If I did that, you'll notice that it's not very even. This line does connect and touch several of the points I, I plotted, but you'll notice that none of the points are above the line. They're all on or below the line. A best fit line should pass sort of in between evenly 
your set of data points so that some of the points lie just above and some just below that line and maybe some right on the line. So this isn't really even. This is sort of a little bit higher than it should be on the, on the graph. So I'm going to take that back off. But let's say I was to try that again and I'm going to draw a line that comes in, sort of passes through my points, but like this. I'll try that. So notice that I've got a line that passes, you know, one's above it, one's below it, this is above it, this is above it, this is slightly below it, and this one's right on. That's pretty good. Um, you can play with it a little bit with your ruler, draw it lightly if you wish, um, but, you know, don't worry about your best line having to be just perfect. As you're drawing your graph, the better you do in drawing your points and setting up your axes, and taking the time with your data points, the, the more quality you'll get from your best fit line. And in the end, that's often the most important piece, that line of best fit. You'll notice I've also drawn my, my line a little bit beyond the data points themselves so that they re it reaches out here a little ways. I'll encourage you to draw a best fit line that goes quite a ways beyond your data points most of the time so that we can make conclusions from it that go beyond just the scope of our data. So that's kind of how a best fit line would look. Yours would have more data points, so your line would probably be a bit longer. But take some time with your graph um, in the next day or so. And uh, if you haven't been plotting your points as, as uh, I went along with this and with your own data, go back and add those to your graph and see if you can't get all your data plotted and a best fit line drawn in neatly uh, by the time I see you again. I'm a little more forgiving this first time around, and so if you have trouble with it uh, and, and things are mistaken, I'll, I'll point them out to you as you hand it in, and I won't start docking for your graph being uh, missing things or poorly done until we get to lab three, which will be the next graph that you'll have to do from a lab. So that's all for now. Today's video is brought to you by our corporate sponsors, Caribou Coffee, my favorite coffee beans, and Oreo cookies, a fine snack no matter how you slice it. Now I'm a double stuffed Oreo fan myself, didn't have any though, so these had to suffice. Wait though until you hear what double stuffed Oreos and a controversy in the news lately have to do with significant figures. If you think I'm kidding, just wait and see.